When you think about the conservation of art, in your mind's eye, you see storage rooms full of paintings, temperature and humidity carefully controlled, armies of experts ready at the drop of a hat to repair any damage with their expertise and their resources. Nowadays, however, more and more artists are taking leave of the painter's brushes. They are moving on to new media such as video, or they're making installations of transient materials such as polystyrene, wax, and scotch tape. Can these works be saved for art lovers of the future? In 2005, the Rotterdam Museum Boymans van Beuningen showed the installation Notion Motion by the Icelandic Danish artist Olafur Eliasson. Eliasson is one of the best known artists of his generation. He makes installations with ephemeral materials such as mist and water. Now the museum is reconstructing the work together with Eliasson's studio. But the question remains, how do you preserve a work made of water, light, and movement? Found it here. Yeah, this is actually, well, not even this. This and this is what we bought. <laughs> So this is the work of Oliver Eliasson, and here, this is probably the most interesting part. So this is, of course, these are our spaces, and then this gives some measurements. But that's all that you buy. And, and here, of course, it's saying that this is a certificate of authenticity, and then it's more like they say, the piece must be installed as described in the installation drawing on this document. So there's the other one. Each new installation must be made in collaboration with Neuge Riemschneider, which is the Berlin Gallery of Oliver Ellison, Oliver Ellison Werkstatt and Bureau, or the Estate of the Artist. You know what I think is wonderful? This is a certificate of authenticity, but it's been faxed and photocopied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was the work originally documented when it was installed in 2005? Um, not in that sense, because we didn't know that we could be able to purchase the work. So what we did was actually that we, when we were deinstalling the work, we knew that we had bought it already, and then we tried to, yeah, to uh, document it. So this is also a challenge for us to see if it works the way we try to document it afterwards. People always ask, how can you ever buy such uh, amazing works? Because this is like 1,500 square meters of work. So, and of it's, made of, it's made of water and light. Water, and light, wood. Uh, so this kind of very poor material. So of course it's a waste of money to keep these materials. So we more or less destroy everything. But we were keeping some samples that we thought can be useful to reconstruct the work. So what you do if you buy a work, this kind of work, which are huge installations, where, so you buy the, the, the concept of the work. The conservation of the concept of an artwork is a new challenge for conservators. But the conservation of contemporary art also has other issues. How to deal with artworks that are dependent on technical equipment? In the 60s, the medium of video arose. Due to the speed with which technology has been developing since, innumerable new possibilities have been created for artists. Meanwhile, however, outdated technologies make it very hard for museums to continue to show these works to the public. Exchange Fields is an interactive video installation by the American artist Bill Seaman. The installation was made and exhibited 10 years ago, and it is now shown for the second time in the Dortmunder U. Despite the fact that the installation is only 10 years old, the equipment was antiquated or had broken down. It has all been replaced, and after thorough study, the work has been digitalized. It's a, a very special kind of piece. There are 13 furniture sculptures in the work, and each of these sculptures kind of suggests how you might position your body with it. So it's a kind of interface strategy, a new kind of interface, this physical interface. And for each of the sculptures, there's a series of dances, a, a suite of different ones, that all relate to the particular part of the body that, that's in it. And so the whole kind of idea is a loop, a kind of cybernetic loop between the 
person who's interacting with the sculpture and then the image that comes up on the screen. And so you have this very strong connection to the image, up to four people working together at one time. There's an element to it, Bill, of a test. Uh-huh. Do you read me? Uh-huh. Are you out there? Do you hear me? I mean, does it understand that Does it understand done? me, uh -huh. yeah. And do you think it's answering you, or? Yes, yes, but it's, it is indeed very quick, and the fact that the two images become overlaid makes you understand that, yes, it is hearing you. Uh -huh. What was the technology that you used for the original installation? Yeah, uh, the original installation was done with LaserDisc, and LaserDisc could hold half an hour of video and instantly be searched and played back very quickly. So in that year, in the year 2000, that was really state of the art. The work is 10 years old, but it has been produced with a video technology which is obsolete today. Bill Seaman used the so-called laser disc at the time, and today it's hard to find any player for this technology. And this, in fact, forms some scenario that we have with many video-based artworks that either the video format or the display equipment is no longer available. And you may have experienced that yourself with some audio tapes or video tapes you have at home. There was a very large team involved in studying the work before the conservation actually started. Why was such thorough study required? In fact, the museum had no documentation on this artwork once it, uh, when they acquired it. They didn't know exactly what was the original format of the video, uh, uh, how the elements interacted. Uh, they had no code from the computer program. Many artists haven't even thought about this issue because they are so much in the present and uh, into future ideas and they don't care that much what will happen with the artwork at the time when they can't look after these works. Uh, and often even institutions like museums didn't consider that in, uh, beforehand and they only realize at a certain time when the artists can't be called in uh, any longer uh, that they, have, uh, they are facing a problem. One of the uh, elements of the restoration effort was an extensive interview with the artist about his intentions. Why is the artist interview so important? The artist can tell us a lot about the artistic intention he followed uh, to create this work, how it was made, how it functions, what is the essence of the work. The issues of preservation, documentation, and presentation gave birth to the symposium Contemporary Art, Who Cares? At the Royal Institute of the Tropics in Amsterdam, a huge crowd of 600 international experts has gathered to exchange knowledge, ideas, and experiences on a topic that is becoming increasingly important, the conservation of contemporary art. While they are working together to get a grip on these issues, the artist Tino Segal turns the world upside down again. He calls his artworks situations. For example, museum guards or visitors turn out to be interpreters of a performance when you're passing by. Segal's works can be seen in museums all over the world, but they leave hardly a trace. The only way to see his works is to experience them yourself. Segal prohibits any kind of written documentation photographs or video registration of his work. We want to talk about his work, but even getting in touch with him was a challenge. You can both speak now. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Segal. This is Tracy Metz. You do not allow any form of documentation of your work by museums and you insisted that YouTube remove all the films that had been made of your work by museum visitors. Why is it that you are so adamant about not having your work registered or documented? Oh, because I think I just don't need it. Now the works can be repeated, and also the core of the work is, you know, this kind of the experience of the visitor. That would be something which would be lost in a video or 
especially in a photo, I'm much more interested into giving a precise and high quality of an experience rather than just somehow distributing it. I mean, we have enough phenomena which get distributed en masse over the globe. What happens when you sell a work? I assume you sign a contract? Who is involved? The sales contract. It's just an oral contract. Instead of a written contract, we do an oral contract, which is legally just as fine. That's why we can also get away with doing it, because it's legally actually sound. We discuss the condition, and then at the end, the buyer and, and Jan shake hands. Explain to me, Jan, how do you show his works without any images or documentation? Well, it's basically quite simple. He comes uh, to the gallery and for, um, for days, sometimes for weeks, uh, you rehearse uh, with him. So instead of, instead of showing a picture to a collector or to a museum person, I, uh, I found, I've uh, found quite a pleasure in doing the movements in front of people. Even if I'm a, from a, a rather a shy person, I think. But um, doing his work in the gallery, um, I've really passed behind certain limits, you know, in terms of exp exposing yourself. I remember very well the first show we did with Tino, um, where we showed all kinds of small excerpts of all the works he had uh, done until that moment. Um, one of the works is uh, the work called Kiss. So it's the work where at one moment, um, or within the piece in the gallery at one moment, and I need to say, and the next piece is guards kissing. And then my assistant came and we started kissing each other um, in front of the collectors or any kind of visitor. And then after that, we would uh, do the piece kiss. So I would go on my knee and I would take my assistant on, the, on my knee. I would let her on the, fall on the floor gently. And then we would do all these movements which are, are part of the word kiss. So, to do that, in order to do that, you have to kind of get over a certain kind of shyness, as you can imagine. It's also the only way, actually, to make it visible, is kind of uh, explain it. Uh, or show it, I mean, do it. The most interesting part of the work is how to preserve the concept. So what is the freedom of the curator or who else is going to reinstall it um, regarding the work? So if, for example, if we have a space which is twice as small as this, is it still the same work? And if we're able to install it in a space twice as small as this, what's going to change? I try to figure out with the artist what are the parameters within we have to work if we reconstruct the work like this? Yeah, this is an essential part of the installation, but what is it? Yes, this is one of the most technical parts of the installation, because if you can see here, this is really mechanics, but always very simple mechanics, which makes that every, this is every three minutes, there's going to be like a sponge over there, and here this is going to be a huge basin of water again. And every three minutes, all of a sudden, the sponge plunges into the water. And this particular part is interesting because when it was first uh, initially installed, this was broke every two days or whatever. So of course, it's also like a way of adjusting, improving things. On the other hand, it's, it's important for Edison that the mechanics are visible, that it's not like a trick. So of course, so therefore, if we make here something which you cannot see or which is completely like computer controlled or whatever, it will definitely be different. So I think these are the parameters that we're trying to find out or to figure out how far can we go, how far does he want to go? And of course also, I can imagine that within 10 years, if we ask him, he's probably into computerized whatever mechanics, and then he will say, okay, okay, it's good to do this, but then probably we as a museum can say, no, but then we change the work. We don't want to have this computerized mechanic. And so there's always this sort of tension and discussion between the collector, in this case the museum, and the artist.
In the beginning, uh, in the original installation, there was a delay between the visitor giving command, shall we say, to the sensor, and that you saw the reaction on the actual screen due to the old equipment. And now the delay has disappeared. Uh -huh. Do you feel that some of the authenticity and the, no, the, I, the scratchiness I mean that, of the work has disappeared? No, in fact, it's more ideal to have less delay. I mean, what, when the piece was made, we were trying to optimize it so that, it, so that the feedback was as quickly as possible. But, but then, you know, there were a series of pieces in the system. There was not only the laser displayer, there were computer-controlled mixers. And so the system had to be talking to everything and had to look at the different levels and all of these things. And now that's all happening in, in software. And I wish I could have done it originally like that, but a digital video at that time didn't have the speed or the clarity. Before we had banks of multiple computers yeah. and multiple laser disc players, yes. now it's completely in the digital realm. I'm sure Bill Seaman was very happy that this work of his exchange fields has been restored, but I can also imagine that there's a certain tension between the artists and the conservator. Artists are more involved in the creation of artworks than in the conservation, of course, and uh, so it's natural that, uh, in particular, I would say, media artists uh, tend to uh, move uh, their ideas into uh, according to the available latest technology and uh, it's the conservators uh, task to care about the authenticity of the work and not to move it into this new technology too quickly uh, and so it's it's a different experience uh, whether you see a black and white film on an old projector with the sound and the light flickering uh, than when you have the same on a flat screen, uh, but some artists would maybe go this way, so then the curator is in this dilemma to decide uh, what uh, approach he might follow. To what extent is the technology really a part of the artwork, or is it only a vehicle underneath the artwork? Well, I, I see it as a vehicle for sure. You He's... kind of want to forget that the technology is even there. You want to be experiencing this dancer. In terms of the furniture sculpture, those could be recreated also. I'm not so worried about the, the aura of the... There's this, this famous uh, statement uh, about the aura of the artwork, but I, I think every artwork carries its sensibility, and, and uh, I don't worry... I mean, for me, a, a digital work or a, a reproduction also carries the, the presence of the of the maker somehow. Even though you can discuss which aspects of an art piece are authentic, conservators always try to stay as close as possible to the original work. But the artist Tino Segal doesn't allow any form of documentation and his artworks have to be transmitted orally from one person to another. Will his work be preserved for future generations? Is the recreation of the, the work in, say, 50 years, is that an exercise in collective memory? No, I don't think that it's about collective memory. I think it's just the most safe way to do it. I think that the discourse around my work is like, oh, it's this kind of fragile thing and will it be forgotten? It will be like a game of telephone. But uh, I assure you that like the opposite would be the case. If I would give like some written instructions, you know, it would always be kind of, then it would really meander. But if people really know what, uh, what they're doing and why they're doing it, that's a much more stable sense. It's also like to get away from my work to go into other realms, like where do you learn stuff? You know, like if you think like the English language or Dutch language, you know, you didn't go to the library or to some archive to learn the Dutch language, you learned from your mother, you know? And you, nobody would be worried that the Dutch language is gonna disappear somehow, although it's being transmitted from like mother to child or father to child or something, you know? It's like, you never, even if there's like a library or a dictionary in teaching you the language, your mother never, used the, the dictionary or looked up the archive, nor did she tell you to go to the archive. No? 
Um, so I think most things in life are passed on, you know, from person to person. I think contemporary art has moved on from thinking that we've got one unique object, you know. Um, in a way, that's the challenge of contemporary art is that that was blown apart. Um, and so, but I think there's a real tendency within contemporary art museums to sort of carry on as if those paradigms were still operational. And what Tino does is he totally blows that away. You know, you've got nothing. You've got nothing. You haven't even got beautiful instructions. You, you can't, I mean, the desire for a conservator is always, you know, to, for these sorts of installation works, you know, to document very meticulously. You know, we would have such amazing documentation about this piece if we were allowed to. It's, it's an itch, you know. And so what it, what it does is it really pushes us back onto thinking about memory. There is uh, still the idea that a conservator, I would say, spends most of its time in a studio behind an easel, behind a painting, with a very pointed brush and does some retouching. And this paradigm has changed a lot within the last decade. The conservator for modern and contemporary art is more and more, you could call it a, a mediator between different professionals in the museum, uh, technicians, uh, curators, registrars, artists involved in trying to, to safeguard these artworks uh, uh, to the next generation. documentation than conservation. Funny, you'd think that the, the concept would be the more ephemeral part and the actual physical materials would stay. But in fact, it's the other way around. It's the other way around, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Without trying to keep the, the, the concept, there's no work. You can keep all those materials here, but if you don't know how to, how to handle, how to use it, it doesn't make any sense. Contemporary art changes constantly and what we need is more thorough, in-depth study of the new materials and the new technologies being involved to uh, safeguard these works into the future. But what we also need is a more collaborative approach involving other disciplines like, for example, anthropology about documentation or interview techn uh, techniques. And we need to continue, as we are doing now, to uh, collaborate in an international context. So the timeless museum object is a myth. So one of the things that we have had in our mind to do, and I think um, it's a good time to do it now, <laughs> is to gather our um, interpreters together for a summer picnic and see if we can have a little moment of conservation. Mm -hmm.